Hello and welcome to News Games and More. I'm your host, Brian Altano. With me is Casey DeFridis. Hey. Jonathan Dornbush. Hello. And Max Scoville. What did, what are you opening? Open a bottle. What did, <laughs> That's not I was gonna be like crack open a beer, but I did I did I didn't do it. Anyway, hi, how's it going? What's up? How's happy to be here? <laughs> First time opening a bottle? It's not I'm excited to try beer for once. He just turned twenty one today, Brian. Words. Come on, give him a break. <laughs> What's in Cheers. your cup, Casey? Beer. No, I'm kidding, it's coffee. <laughs> What about you, Jonathan? Pure coffee. Just it's just coffee. I, have I feel like that, yeah. I feel like you guys are are more crazy for having coffee at four p.m. than having a beer. That's I think that's reckless. I just Here. have uh, coffee to sustain me. I don't really use it to get like an energy boost. It's literally just to stay awake. Yeah. Well, well you know, I'm I don't like, blame you guys. How can I avoid eating for as long as possible? Because making food without a microwave is hard. That actually will help me segue into our first story, Casey. And let's see you're if welcome. I can actually do this. Uh, you can save a lot of money by not eating, and you're going to need a lot of money if you want a PlayStation 5, because we got a rumor this week from Bloomberg that it might be uh, upwards of $550 at launch when it does up potentially still launch this November. Um, Bloomberg reports cites people familiar with the matter are claiming that Sony is set to produce fewer PS5s. I'll get into that in a second. But one of the reasons that they're looking at the price tag for being what it is, obviously all the specs and chipsets going into it, um, and that's going hand in hand with what they're expecting to be supply constraints and limitations at launch. I think they're potentially positioning this thing as sort of a premium item. Uh, it says Sony anticipates the console's price tag to come in around 499 to $549, a figure the company thinks could put off some potential buyers in a launch year, meaning it will scale down production. Um, I don't think this price is uh, significantly out of range from what we've all been sort of theorizing for a long time. Um, I think people who sort of have tracking this um, or who buy kind of higher end tech semi-frequently kind of have an understanding of, of what they're getting into here. But uh, I do think that I, I read a lot of chatter from the average consumer still expecting $400 consoles. How do you guys feel about all this? How's this price looking for you? I, I, I mean, I think it's going to come down a lot to what Microsoft also does. Um, I think, I, I think 500 is totally reasonable, uh, uh, something to expect. I don't think we'll see above 500 because you start to get into some dicey territory for a lot of people, even if there is a limited supply. But, right. um, you, you know, we saw, I do still think the PS3 launch still hangs so large over Sony. It really looms pretty heavily, I think, on them, as does, I think, what happened with Xbox and the Xbox One release, which was also $100 more than the PS4. So I think... As much as it's reasonable that we could see 500, I think if Xbox suddenly comes in with something at a much lower price, I think Sony will have to respond in kind. I don't know if about you guys, but I initially looked at this story and thought of it like as I've been conditioned to think of things as a response to like COVID stuff and being like, oh, they're going to sort of limit supplies or it's going to be, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of like going to be being conservative with their estimates and uh, in reality, I think it's. I think this could also just as easily be in response to the fact that they're, and we've talked about this on 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 Beyond extensively. But th we're not really. It doesn't really feel like we need a new console generation quite yet. I, like, I I'm very glad you said that because I actually feel the same way. I don't think I'm ready for new consoles already. I don't know if I feel like we're the outliers, right, Max? Everyone always wants a new shiny thing, but I mean, it's it's exciting, it's fun, but at the same time, you you know, when a new thing launches, it always takes a cool minute for it to kind of catch up. And uh, we also this this last console generation was pretty much the first one where we had sort of a half measure, like we had we had the Series X and the PS4 Pro. So I can see there are probably plenty of people who jumped on those and were like, oh, I'm kind of good on this. It does. You know, it right. does 4K, it does HDR, it, it's, uh, it's current, you know, current gen games look phenomenal. And as of right now, we don't really know any of the bells and whistles that are going to really make this next console generation a huge, like a huge leap forward. So, well, yeah. And I, especially, oh, sorry. No, go for it. I was going to say, especially at launch, it's going to come down to, I mean, of course, we're going to want to get one because this is our job. We're covering every aspect of the industry. Like we're an outlier in that regard, but depends on what the games are going to be. Like if the launch lineup, and obviously we could be seeing delays in games due to COVID, um, 
the if the launch lineup isn't there, if there's not enough to appeal to people, if it's just a bunch of stuff that you can also get on your PS4 Pro and Series X and it looks great, they're going to have a really hard time of getting a mass audience to want to get these things anyway. Right. No, I totally agree. Um, to machine gun through a couple of points you guys brought up, because I think you're saying some really smart stuff. Uh, one, Max, I, I completely agree that my gut reaction to this story was this is COVID related, because I think we've been conditioned to think about that for everything. I was reading about Brian Dennehy dying today from he's an actor who is in Tommy Boy. It's like one of my favorite comedies of all time. My I love the Tom, Tommy was, Boy is what you know him for. <laughs> yeah, that's what everybody knows him for. It also <laughs> prepared me for his death because that's the entire movie wraps around that. Um, spoilers. And my gut, re- my yeah, spoilers. My gut reaction was this is coronavirus related, and it's not. And I, in you, when you read in um, obituaries now, you read in almost any news story for anything, people have to caveat with this is not related to that. That said, I still do think that that's going to impact pretty much everything this year, including PS5 production. And so, if if they're already sort of getting ahead of things, being like they're is already going to be slightly limited production and that's before we're even factoring that stuff in that's definitely an issue uh two i'm with all of you and i don't necessarily think we need a ps5 just yet i've said that repeatedly having uh numerous first party sony games now being delayed uh quote unquote indefinitely uh is furthering the energy and momentum that this current generation still has and so uh, i the more those move into the fall uh, the less you really have a reason to go run out and, and spend this kind of money on something. And, and lastly, and then I'll move on uh, and let you guys talk because there's a lot to say here. Um, I think people balked at the PS3 price at $599 because back then video game systems were just that. Whereas now I think people are conditioned to think of them more as multimedia devices. We use them as all-purpose things for everything. Uh we're also used to spending a lot more money on phones. And so I think creeping up in the $500 range is, is, is getting better. 600 is way too high still, but paying anything, anything with like a 49 at the end feels wrong. It feels like, yeah. you know, like, like it feels like they should give me a pack in game or it feels like they screwed up and they're dumping the extra 50 bucks on. on me. <laughs> well, it, it's also worth noting that, I mean, for at least the last couple of generations, the cheaper console has won. Um, yeah. Overall, obviously, we saw the 360 and the PS3 even out by the end of that generation. But in terms of the momentum, the cheaper console normally had the advantage going into it. Um, and also to your point earlier about like uh, assuming this is COVID-19 related. Interestingly, the Bloomberg article points out they're like it's only a factor in the production issues, but it's apparently going to be a really big factor in their promotional plans. And I think that's a really interesting question mark of how we're going to see both Sony and Microsoft convince people to buy these things when they can't have people gather en masse to demo them and to see them beyond YouTube trailers. Yeah, they specifically that, said yeah. that they won't be, they most likely won't be doing a press conference in person. So how are they going to do that? And I know the current environment kind of pushed them to rush to get the reveal out for the new controller. And Maybe they'll be better prepared for a full reveal for the system later down the line. But back on the on the price point, um, they said, Brian, I don't know if you, you already mentioned this, but they said they were going to only do five to six million units during the fiscal year ending at March 2021. Yeah, I did but not mention PS, that yet. Yeah, but the PS4 sold more than seven million in its first five months. Right. So... And I know the PS4 had a $100 cheaper price tag. I think it was at $400 instead of the $500 that we're looking. But I, I say, I, I see $500 is not that different from $400 can, considering the, the time difference between the two. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that. I think that the issue with the PS or the, not not really an issue, but the the sort of like um, the the saving grace of the PS4 at launch was one. Um, everything that happened with Xbox, which was sort of reverse PR, shooting themselves in the foot. And two, I think that by the end of the PS3 generation, we felt ready to move on at collectively. You know, we, I, I was like, it, like, okay, I'm, I'm playing FF7 right now, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And, yeah. yeah, and it's my system sounds like it's about to take off. So that's my major complaint from a hardware perspective. But looking at that game, I'm like, this is stunning. Mm-hmm. I'm 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 okay. I don't really need a new one immediately. I think a, like an interesting thing that we're not really thinking about just yet is that the Nintendo Wii was one of the most historically supply constrained consoles of all time. Also, one of the what top three best selling systems ever. But I remember for months people were lined up outside of stores, as Casey mentioned. Not really a thing you can do right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And so people got their hands on this thing. We don't really know if that was Nintendo sort of like illegally like cooking the books there and and you know hiding hiding sh- holding shipments back to create sort of like a tickle me elmo style fervor um but th- th- with this uh, th- sort of getting ahead of it right now i immediately got anxiety being like am i going to have to be am i going to be refreshing six different websites trying to pre-order this thing that i don't Probably. even know if i, need I mean yet? that's yeah. Yeah. that's an interesting one because it like it's i don't I don't, I'm not good at math and I'm not a person who understands business, but from where I'm sitting, it seems like there is probably going to be less demand just in the sheer nature that current hardware is great. People seem like pretty set on that kind of things. A lot of people just went out and bought a Nintendo Switch. And if, you know, every gaming system is created equal in the minds of sort of casual gamers, then that's, you're less compelled to go out and buy a new piece of hardware that costs literally twice as much. Uh, so there, let's, let's just say there's like less supply just across the board. I imagine a lot of people are going to be probably, probably bootstrapping because there's a shit ton of people unemployed right now, which is terrifying. Uh, mm-hmm. and then flip side of that on the, on the supply end of things, uh, we are seeing factories shut down. We are seeing like, you know, global economic stuff get completely upset. So if there's, you know, if there's less demand and there's less supply, then it makes a whole lot of sense to be like, let's just scale back accordingly and if it does make sense if the thing sells out and there's continued demand for it then you know you up the supply a little bit as much as you can but it it obviously it's gonna it's gonna hurt sony on a business side of things if they're not selling you know on the scale of the ps4 but at the same time it doesn't hurt them if there's this if there's this demand for a thing that they have yeah it's also oh sorry go ahead i mean i was gonna say like we see memes of people going to target and, and there's like a handwritten sign outside that's like Sorry, we are out of flour and also Nintendo Switch. I don't know why I said it in that accent. But, <laughs> but like, there's that whole thing where it's like, it's like people, people are like, that's Nintendo Switch is flying off the shelves right now, along with like bleach and hand sanitizer, like along with actual essentials because people are like, I need this thing. I'm cooped up. So like, no eggs, that, no yeah, Nintendo and, Switch. No eggs, yeah. yeah. And if that, if that kind of thing becomes like, if that gets memetic and it's like, if it also, it's a bad look for a company to have tons and tons of things on a shelf that basically tells c- customers not so subtly nobody wants this mm-hmm. yeah if, see uh if there's a see sign says, xbox yeah. launch in japan yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly yeah i was gonna exactly say like as much as you know they'll want to match what the ps4 did it's a much better pr move and all of this is pr all of this is trying to figure out the best messaging to convince people this is something worth buying it'll be a lot better of them to say even if they sell you know three million less units than the ps4 did in that same window it'll be still great for them to be able to say the ps5 is selling out everywhere right then it will be to say hey there's two million sitting in an amazon warehouse don't you want these yeah, yeah I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point. It's that, that wonderful key difference between the words like shipped and sold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which Sony for generations loved mm-hmm. leaning on the sold side and then not necessarily, uh, uh, or the ship side and not necessarily the sold side. Um, I'm going to ask you guys something. The uh, Xbox Series X, for everything we know right now, has uh, been on track. It's... Uh, we have heard from Phil Spencer that they will not delay this console for any particular game. Um, it doesn't seem like they've piped up about anything COVID related, uh, halting any sort of production or development. Although I can imagine that's happening in the background. What happens this fall if consumers are faced with this choice between purchasing one of these consoles? They're both priced similarly. Um, from what we're seeing right now, in some measures, uh, the Series X is a little more expensive. But what if when you go to the store, only one of them is readily available and the other one is straight up sold out? Do you think that's going to change the console wars a little bit? Will it will it get the sort of fence-sitting independence of the console wars to switch sides I, to buy I, a console they wouldn't historically buy? I feel like the biggest demographic that would affect would be parents or family going to the store to buy a system for their kids and then being, hey, I want to buy a PS5 for Billy and there's no PS5, so they bring back the Xbox um, Series X instead. And Billy gets sad, but it's fine because it's still a new system, right? But sorry. (laughs) Um, If I was Billy's dad and I bought Billy a $600 console and he was sad, I... Billy would have to find you a new I, well, I, went to, I went to school with a kid named Timmy, and he was supposed to get a Nintendo 64 for Christmas. But also, oh, two things. One, his parents were divorced and rich. And two, his birthday was on Christmas. I'm not making right. this up. So he was like, he, he would, by all logic, he should have gotten like presents cubed 
Like it should have just been like this massive thing. And it, it, he was very spoiled. So that was the case. He was supposed to get an N64 on Christmas day, but they were sold out all over. So he had a PlayStation instead. And then I went over to his house a couple of days later and the, the N64 had shown up at that point. We were so excited to go and play all these brand new things, but he didn't get an RF switch. So he couldn't hook it up to his TV. So we just played Donkey Kong country three on super Nintendo. <laughs> I don't know what the moral of the story is. Well, there, you but. ignored the PlayStation. Yeah, we're we're like cool PlayStation. What is what's on that? And we're like I don't know any of no, not Mario. That's for damn sure. Yeah, so I feel like that might happen in in that situation. But for everyone else who can make their own decisions, I mean, if all of my friends are getting a PS5 and I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go get a PS5, and there isn't any, I'm not going to switch the Xbox because right. I want to get what my friends have. So the, that the, won't yeah. affect my decision making. The other weird thing is like, what if? what if these things start happening at different intervals? Like we're, t- we're so used to sort of like Xbox and PlayStation launching kind of side by side, but it really was only, it was kind of only last gen that that happened. Like the PS3 and the 360 came out years apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, prior to that, like the, the original Xbox and the PS2 were like, they didn't come out the same holiday window. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, are I we, think the are difference we is, at, yeah. Well, we, we, I think we both, both of these companies have, uh, maintain that they are, they will be launching new hardware this fall um that is a large window uh, in the, in the same way like q4 is a large window i mean these are like uh th- th- this is anywhere in a in a four month range essentially uh and so yeah. will they launch in the same week or the same day i i don't know i don't think so who will be first um the, everyone's always sort of historically said the first to 10 million units sold is is the winner um but by this story, Sony will have at max only sold five to six million units by March twenty twenty one. Um, so yeah, no, we'll see. I, I I think it will be closer than we imagine. But I think the thing you brought up earlier about Nintendo Switch, I mean, anecdotally right now, the Switch is killing it, and we haven't even seen NPD for the month that Animal Crossing launched. Like the amount of people that we, I think we all collectively know who bought a Switch who don't even play video games i was like on a like a facetime call with like six people in my family the other day and my cousin who like hasn't bought a video game system in 20 years was like hey brian check it out i got animal crossing and i was like oh cool Mm -hmm. let's like let's visit each other's towns like no that's a that's happening right now my 40 year old stepsister bought one and my six-year-old niece just got one like i think that there's this like also like i think that what the coronavirus stuff is making people do is regress and it's making people be like i need comfort food and like nintendo is a thing from your childhood that is like safe and colorful and happy and like you know as much as i love like you know cutting edge next gen gaming shit i'm also like i don't know like i'm not really that amped on the last of us two right now you know it's like i'm kind of yeah like bring on you know let's go let's go hang out with those raccoons and the bears and trade peaches or whatever you know no i mean uh nintendo is a frozen pizza or like a warm bowl of mac and cheese right now and i I guess the other guys are like high-end steakhouses and i don't really feel like going to one of those right now (laughs) You know, uh, there's enough at home, basically. Like we have, we have our, our pa- this is the time to go through our backlogs and our pantries, I guess. You know, what's going to, you know, what's probably going to move the needle if uh, whichever, whichever of the sort of the, the big consoles is like, oh, and by the way, this is super duper compatible with various like, like Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or like whatever the thing is, whichever one is like, you can use it for that. Hook it up to your TV and talk to your family. Like, yeah, you know, what's weird. There was, um, Remember that? Did did you guys all get a, an Xbox One at launch? No. When? No. I got one in 2015. No. Mm-hmm. Um. So I got one at launch, and I had a couple friends and family members that did. And there was this like year, or like maybe six months, where we did all of our like social gatherings like cross country on uh, Connect. Oh yeah. And yeah, Connect was weird because like when you know we're we're all using various like sort of like video teleconferencing software now, whether for fun or for work, um, and they all have their you know strengths and weaknesses. Something like Google Hangouts will uh, sort of uh, enlarge the screen of whoever's talking. Connect would slowly zoom on whoever yeah, it was looked, talking. It, it looked like that like Ben Affleck meme of like "Hello Darkness, my old friend," where it would just slowly push <laughs> yeah. in on the one person. And so like I remember like we like connect connected i don't know what we called it oh, but we, no. we like video conference like six uh people on my wife's family side on thanksgiving and they're all like across like two long couches and they're all just talking at once and the connect was just like zooming in and out i just didn't know what to do well i it's mean very it's stupid. really 
it's really funny because a lot of the failures of the Xbox One at launch were because of the mixed messaging when they initially showed it, and it was this all-in-one entertainment system, and that was the big thing they were pushing. And PlayStation responded being like, this is for gamers first, we're focused on the games, that other stuff can come later. But the reality of it is now is, yeah, we're using all these tools to communicate with each other, to stay together. I can't imagine not having Netflix and HBO and YouTube on my PS4 right now, like the perennial joke of when is Netflix coming to Switch. Yeah, um, yeah like that is that's an expected part of the experience now. And I, I am curious to see how the companies are going to position that stuff because we already do have a lot of stuff that plays Netflix in 4K if we want it, so. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, it's, we got, it's weird that you look, at, you look at sort of the last generation of hardware and it's like the Xbox came with a camera that you could use to talk to your aunt and uncle, you know, like it, nothing else did. And it, it seems almost like weird that the, the Switch doesn't have a camera on it. Like it feels like it should, but... I feel yeah, like the Wii, that, the Wii U, the gamepad has a camera on it. Right? Yeah. Like you can, you can, yeah. and that also, they promised like video chat on that. And that never, I don't think that ever materialized. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really glad the Switch doesn't, honestly, because I remember playing some mini games with the Wii U and holding the gamepad. And it's not a good look holding something below you and looking Thank down. You. No, it's, it's uh, bad it's enough seeing awful. your reflection in the Switch screen between when it's loading. Casey, do you remember Imagine the amount of times that you, you opened your 3DS and it like opened the internal camera and you're just like, <laughs> that angle? It's like, no. Oh, it's, that is the worst angle in the world. Yeah. Um, I wanted to read a quick comment from uh, an IGN user, uh, Dirty Bastard Twenty. I hope that's an ODB <laughs> reference. He says, "I'm excited for the PS5, but I'm not in a rush to buy it. I'll buy a controller and use it on my PS4 to get a feel for everything. That'll give me enough time to save up for a new console. Plus, I'll have Cyberpunk to keep me company with Last Gen. That's the only game I'm waiting for, anyway. So there's lots to unpack there, but I think that what the gist of what he's saying is he's got a lot to go with here." Uh, but he wants to buy a dual sense to play on PS4, which I don't believe we've confirmed. Do we? Or I don't not. think they have said anything about that, Jonathan. Uh, in terms of uh, cross compatibility, no, we mm-hmm. haven't really gotten any information on that. the The dual sense reveal, while it did tell us a lot, left a lot of questions hanging. I mean, as weird as it is, we didn't even see the bottom of the controller. So you know, like on a functional level, people have wondered if those back paddles will be part of it. So yeah, we we don't know. DualShock 4 to DualSense and any of that stuff is still a question. We asked, but they're not giving any more comment at this time. Have you, have any of you guys ever purchased um, uh, like peripherals or uh, games for a console you didn't have yet or hadn't launched yet just mm. to like get a hold of it early and just sort of start that, that hype process for yourselves? No. I think for the Game Boy Advance. <laughs> I think I bought so, some yeah. stuff and some games for the GBA, and I rented one from Blockbuster. Uh, in the meantime, I, think I, I couldn't buy one. I've done it with like cases and stuff like that. Like you'll get like a case for like your Switch or something, or, or like your phone, <laughs> three days before your you know your thing comes in. But I remember specifically like I bought like a couple DS games and some styluses before the DS came out, and I was like, "Whoa, it's like a Nintendo game, but it's like so small." And I just like. <laughs> Held it, licked it for two days. Yeah, I just licked it. Back I when think you could do I, that. I. So I used to I used to work for uh, independent gaming website Destructoid, and I think I borrowed some PlayStation Move controllers, finding out that that was there was going to be compatibility with some games coming to PS4, or that it was going to do something with like the old camera, and it was like I was like, oh, I want to mess with that, and I like borrowed them, and then it didn't really do anything I expected it to, and then I just wound up with like. And I think I, I wound up like getting rid of them before the PSVR came out. So it was like I had these these borrowed peripherals that didn't really have any bearing on the hardware that I hadn't gotten yet. So yeah, I mean we we know that uh, PS4 controllers are going to work on PS5 in in some capacity, and that's mm-hmm. right. I don't think we do actually. We don't know because we I, don't know shit, man. We don't. I'm going to double I check, thought, but I'm pretty sure they haven't said. While you're teeing that. that up, Jonathan, I thought yeah. that that was the sort of um, the the thing, the the controller adapter thing you got. Well, the, yeah, the the back button attachment. So that that's been attachment. our assumption. Like I was saying, we haven't even seen the bottom of the dual sense, which is mm-hmm. very weird. But my assumption was always we saw the DualShock Four get that attachment. I mean, we're you know seven years into the life of this console. It's a weird time for a first party attachment to come out. Um, yeah, but they they haven't officially commented on whether that will be part of it going forward. 
Um, and I don't think they have said the DualShock 4 will work with the PS5, but it, that's just sort of the assumption we're all working with. All right. Well, in the meantime, uh, we will move on by uh, moving backwards in time to uh, Crisis, a game that is now coming to PS4, Xbox, and Switch, the remaster of the classic uh, sort of benchmark for how cool and strong your PC was. And if your PC couldn't play Crisis, everyone threw rocks at you, <laughs> beat you up on the playground and such. Um, the uh, Crisis Twitter uh, tweeted something yesterday for the first time in ages, and that immediately sort of blew the gates open for what this could be. And today, the officially announced Crisis Remastered is coming to PC, Xbox One, PS4, and the Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is the... yeah. This is it the can first run crisis. crisis. Can't I? Yeah. It might be too pessimistic by thinking like, can it though? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love my Switch. I I just remember Crisis being like, the most beautiful game. Right in two thousand seven. Yeah. Do you do you like it's that engine got gutted and used for like Far Cry two, and then they made eighteen Far Cry games in that engine in various iterations since then. Uh, and Crisis 2 disappointed everyone, and Crisis 3 was pretty... <laughs> and, like, Crytek is now, like, free to develop. Like, that was so long ago. It was so totally... Like, nostalgic goggles. No, exactly. <laughs> it was, like, it was photorealistic. It was put... Like, it wasn't bad-looking by any means, but, like, they got... I mean, they got Crisis up and running on 360 probably 10 years ago, so... They got... Um, specifically, Saber Interactive got The Witcher 3 running Nintendo Switch um, in whatever way they got that to happen. Uh, some, some people may argue that's sort of like a bastardized way to play that game. I think it's totally playable. Um, Especially after the, the recent update. They made it a yeah. lot better. Yeah, seriously. Um, so they have a sort of weird track record with Switch games, by the way. Um, they did uh, NBA Playgrounds, which they then, uh, which they kind of botched the launch of, but then um, did an updated version, which uh, was essentially a new SKU, which allowed them to hit the top of the new release charts again. It's kind of a devious move. After that, they did Shaq Fu, which was uh, not great. They ported the Ghostbusters game. And most recently, uh, World War Z was announced, I believe, just the other day as coming to Switch, which I think they said was one of the most difficult ports they've ever had to do. Um, for Crisis specifically, yeah, I think you guys are all right. Like This is, um, this is a very old game uh but it still had a lot going on under the hood that i'm not entirely sure that the switch is capable of nailing that game is 13 years old you're 13 should years be old. fine <laughs> damn <laughs> that game like i have to i have to like fact check myself because i remember like i have a weird free association of like talking about crisis when i was in high school and it's not quite that old but like, I think I was still young enough that I was. I had friends who were in high school when Crisis came out. Yeah. I remember talking about it when I worked at GameStop, which was my first job. So a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's dig into some of the stats a little bit on this. Um, it features improved graphics and optimizations for current gen consoles. This includes high quality textures, improved art assets, temporal anti-aliasing, SSDO, SVOGI. I'm, I was really worried about that one. Depth fields, new light settings, motion blur, blur, and particle effects where applicable. And there will even be software-based ray tracing. So I have a feeling not all of that will be on Switch. Those are big <laughs> words for Switch. Those are fighting words. Too big to fit onto a cartridge. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think the Switch version will be a pared-down version of when it comes to the other platforms, but as we mentioned sort of at the top of this, this is Saber who managed to get Witcher 3 on the Switch um, and in playable form. I do think it's probably not going to be the best version of Crisis to play, but um, I definitely have faith in them with the work they've done before to be able to transplant it. Yes, exactly. Um, I, th I think you're totally right. I think the, the Witcher really, it sort of changed the rules, honestly, in terms of expectations of uh, what we could foreseeably understand could even work on Switch. Because that's, that's not even, that's, that is a very recent game. Um, and it's one of the sort of most feature rich and grandiose no, that's, video games ever made. That's like, that's witchcraft, no pun intended. Yeah. That shouldn't, <laughs> yeah. the fact that that game came out and people were like, it doesn't look that great. And it's like, it's playing on a glorified Android tablet. 
and yeah, it, and it I mean, works. We, we and then they were like, we, we patched it. It looks better, you know? We see that we endearingly. <laughs> I totally agree. We mentioned a couple of handheld systems earlier, like the like the DS, the 3DS, the GBA. I, I'm a huge handheld gamer, always have been. The amount of bastardized ports of uh, licensed games, current gen games, last gen games that I have played on those systems, pretending that they could even pr- like uh, attempt to live up to you know uh, their big brothers on consoles uh, is laughable. I remember buying uh, Peter Peter Jackson's King Kong for the Nintendo DS, which is historically, I will argue, one of the worst looking video games ever ever made. I wish I had footage to show you <laughs> right this second. Uh, maybe I'll tease some up. Um, like who who was that Naomi? Who's in that movie? What? Naomi Watts. Yeah, Naomi Watts. Yeah. In 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 this game, um, they basically just uh, they they made she's like a seven polygons that they like took half of and and reverse on each side, and she just looks like she was hit by like eight cars. It's like oh, half a first person shooter. Uh, it's it's just horrendous. Like handheld gaming for the longest time was was basically where where ports went to die. Uh, and now I think we're living in a different world. So I will ask you guys, uh, what what would you pay for this game on Switch? What do you pay for a 13-year-old game, which has, has been remastered? $13. One for each year. One for That's... every year. <laughs> I was, was going to say, like, uh, um, 25 or 30 Okay. I think, I think 20 bucks is, is probably the sweet spot, and then put it on sale when, you know, not enough people want to play it or whatever. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I would expect it to go for 40 Probably not, that, yeah. and not that, that I would pay that, but that's what I'm expecting the initial price to be. Yeah, that kind of that 60. actually. Yeah, Witcher. Yeah. I mean, but Witcher came out five years ago. Yeah, that's true. Like Witcher's, a, Witcher's a new game. You know, like I think that Crisis yeah. is going to fall into that sort of Saints Row Three territory where they're like, hey, it's you know, it's sort of greatest hits collection kind of thing. Right, you know, I feel like we should have. In, What's up? I was just going to say, I feel like we should have more examples off the top of our head because we talk and complain about this so often on Nintendo Voice Chat about like really old games coming out for the Switch and being like fifty or sixty dollars. But I can't yeah. remember any of them at the moment. I mean, I, I can tell you for starters, uh, I believe Resident Evil Four was thirty or forty dollars, and that that felt wrong specifically because it was more expensive than it was currently on. Uh, current and last gen consoles, and that's the thing that like people have dubbed the Switch tax, yeah. which is when games launch simultaneously across multiple platforms, and the Switch ones is inexplicably the most expensive. And people mm. have chalked that up to the fact that the um, the carts are a little harder or are more expensive to produce than the standard issue discs. Uh, it's because the, still, the, chem- the chemicals they put on them to make you not eat them is actually, it's very expensive <laughs> to put the chemicals on there. That's true. Yeah, it's that sour apple stuff they put in those things so dogs don't eat the couch or whatever. I mean, that uh, spray is expensive. You ever try to get expensive. your cat not yeah. to chew on wires? It's expensive. Use tinfoil. <laughs> put tinfoil on the wires. Use the Witcher on Switch. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I was going to say, like, gonna say, go for it. The w- I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to, but after you, good sir. Uh, we need, no, a, we need a buzzer. <laughs> yeah. The, the weird, the weird thing about playing Crisis in 2020 is that that game is set in 2020. Mm. Uh, and it's about like a weird nuclear engagement with North Korean forces that results in aliens making contact. Uh-huh. Which yeah, is they they call that paleo future, and that's like yeah. one of my favorite concepts. Is, is sort of like the uh, we were already living past the the year where the Jetsons took place. Oh yeah, just a heads up. I to mean, be I'm fair, like the, where's the, my robot? The Jetsons my suitcase could be, turns into a car. The Jetsons could be happening very high in the in the sky, like they could be up there. That's actually yeah. I was thinking about that. Maybe the sure. Jetsons is heaven. No one's yeah. been up anyway, there. Uh, Rila97 on IGN says, I went from needing a PC powered by a black hole to a small handheld console just to run Crisis. Goddamn, technology is beautiful. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, a bunch of other people in the comments were kind of dunking on the Switch, but this is, I, I, I appreciate that. We'll see how the, the new Crisis runs, because my assumption is this is to gauge interest in continuing the franchise. Like, this seems a little bit too out of the blue. <laughs> Yeah. To me, I mean, in my mind, you're remastering a franchise we haven't seen in several years is to see how people feel about it currently. Uh, the other weird thing is that's that's an EA game, right? Or does Crytek own it now? Like, I, think I, think, Crytek I believe might. Crytek owns it because EA um, made a pact with God to not put anything that's really enjoyable <laughs> on Switch. 
So yeah, okay. So maybe the first one, but like two and two and three were published by EA. The first the one was least. originally as well. Okay, I wonder if they just did yeah. some weird wrangling to get that out of their out of their mitts. Yeah, Casey, you and I are the... like we we co-host Nintendo Voice Chat every single week. We're longtime hard Nintendo fans. Uh, isn't it delightful to see this level of third-party support finally hitting? Uh, a Nintendo platform. It is insane, and I never expected it, especially after the Wii and the Wii U. <laughs> We're yes. finally getting it from everyone except for EA. Yeah, it was it, as a. I, I had the other consoles when the Wii came out, but it was very difficult to look over and see people playing like Dark Souls. And I was like, "Well, have you checked out Steven Spielberg's Boom Blocks? You can knock down the blocks <laughs> and then to blow them up." He's a, he made ET. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, speaking of ancient video games, did you want to say something, Jonathan? I was just going to say it's worth noting. I, I'm looking at the press release that we got in. There's no mention of EA or Electronic Arts, uh, just Crytek. And, okay, so they, I'm guessing yeah. they wrangled that. That out. I wonder if that was like a time a time deal or something. Yeah, the, the thing that I think less than the graphics, the thing that's going to be tricky with that is how the structure of of games has changed. Because like that game was mm-hmm. pretty revolutionary when it came out. It's like pretty open worldish first person stuff but like they've fine-tuned the hell out of that like we've gotten however many far cry games and i don't know it's gonna i think it's gonna be a different like a different kind of thing like it's people are gonna be like oh this is this part aged weirdly you know yeah you you mentioned this running on the same engine as the far cry games um i would really like to see those on switch that would be Just nice throwing that out there um have we gotten we have we have we got an Assassin's Creed on Switch? Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of Assassin's Creeds on Switch, actually. Oh, there's, that's right. Yeah, huh? Ports, like, yeah. After the fact, it's not. Yeah. It's not exactly. Mm-hmm. It's not exactly the Crytek engine, but it's like this weird bastard version that they they use to make. Like that's. I think that's why Far Cry is called Far Cry. Mm-hmm. It's like kind of a nod to uh. Crisis, but then it became its own thing. And um. Let's see, we're going to get through this next story fairly quickly, but I'm glad Max is here because he has some stuff to say about this. Uh, Star Wars Episode One Racer is coming to PS4 and Switch on May 12th. Uh, yeah. You are you you, were, you were uh, insulting like Jonathan Dornbush, yeah, who's excited God. too. Are you really? Yes, yeah. I loved this game as a kid. Do I think it's a great game? No, no. <laughs> okay. Like, in my, so the thing is, I think about this game. I was thinking about it a lot this morning after the story. I loved this game as a kid and I played it so much. But when I like mentally picture it, that game is a barren wasteland. Like, nothing <laughs> exists that, on the racetracks. Is and that on purpose? Yeah. I am. Yes and no. But <laughs> I am buying this game drunk. Like, I don't, I don't, yeah, I want to support yeah. my local. Uh, Gascano and my Sebulbas and my Dud Bolt yeah. and my uh, Mars Duo. Like, I like hold. For Max, you don't the, have to be drunk to want to buy this. You're just gonna buy it. You 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 don't need any. This is help. this is like a hundred percent one of those things that I'd be like, I'd be like fifteen dollars for an N sixty four game. You gotta be kidding me. This is this is also how I bought Racer Revenge on on <laughs> PS four, yeah. which is also like not what I wanted it to be. But here here are my my three reactions. First of all, I'm going to I, I want to say. That news is so wizard. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, yippee! And then three, if it actually works on Switch, I'm going to say it's working. It's working. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, you brought up a really good point that I think that we, as a industry and fans and gamers collectively, need to get better at, which is celebrating games that aren't great, but we still love them anyway. Everything is so fucking binary now where people yeah. are constantly like it's the best game ever or the worst game ever i think we need to celebrate games that are not that great but fun as hell or okay but we really love like there, yeah, there has to be a, a line in the sand there no pun intended this was a thing on um, the sands of tatooine uh, yeah this is a thing i loved as a kid and played a ton and will probably buy and play every six months when I have a couple people over. I'm like, hey, you remember that game too, right? You had a friend 64, let's play a race. We'll play three races and be like, all right, let's play Jackbox. Like, uh, I'll be okay with that if that's what this game is. Um, Selfishly, it does have a platinum trophy on PS4, so that's great for me. But Mm. um, yeah, I'm excited to go back to it just because it has been, the last time I played it, I think, was like five or six years ago. Um, So... Brian, I think that I think that we should really push the entire online competitive scene with this. It does have <laughs> online multiplayer, and I think we should try to become that two-headed announcer who, you know, shoutcasts the the Boonta Eve race. 
So I've actually never played this game before, if you can believe it. Have you ever so, seen Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace? I have, many imagine, times. Imagine if the pod race scene were in fact a playable video game with over five I, to eight different playable racers of all sorts of species and varieties. I could have never imagined. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> but I, I would like. So what, what I love about this is the restraint where they could have so easily at this in this like it. The time when this game came out, they could have totally been like, we need to make a Twisted Metal clone. But they waited several years to do that to make Star Wars Demolition, and instead they just made a straightforward racing game where you had some boosts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, if we weren't all stuck at home, I would ask to come over and hang out and play Star Wars with you guys. But we can't. So maybe we can do it online. (laughs) We have, Yeah, we can do it online. Let's make a pact and all get drunk and buy this game. And Let's try right. to buy the, the pod racer. And All I don't right. think you. I don't How think do we do need, this? You don't need. Do fist you bump don't the need camera. To, let's, yeah, let's fist bump. There we go. So I've, I've talked about. Max. There, shut we up. there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, you don't, I, I'm going to say real quick you don't, you don't have to get drunk to buy this game. You can buy this game sober. But <laughs> you're probably going to get drunk anyway for whatever reason the universe has handed you. So why not tether some purpose to that evening? Here's by the thing: purchasing Episode if, One Pod Racer. If you're drunk when you purchase Episode One Pod Racer on the Nintendo Switch handheld console entertainment system, you have a good excuse for why you did that, which is that you had you were drunk. But if you if you weren't, people are like, why did you do this? And you'd be like, well, I think that you pod, saw the I like the pod. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, your goggles. So the thing I do want to point out, the, the best thing that EA could do, aside from stop doing a lot of the stuff they're doing and really just knock it <laughs> off over there, is if they got Criterion Games, who's famous for doing burnout and all that nonsense, and made them do an episode one pod racer yes. game with modern, just put it in frostbite. You already rotoscoped all the all the different greeblies and bullshit for the <laughs> battlefront. Just make that stuff go real fast. You had like <laughs> speeder bike training missions. Just give us a beautiful cutting edge. Pod Racer reboot from a racing game company. Do it. Get on it. Oh, I would, Get on there. I would love that so much. Could you imagine like a like a 4K HDR Sebulba? <laughs> oh, oh, just the best. Oh, it'd be horrible. Um, all right, I want to move on to the next story because I put it in the thumbnail art, and anyone who clicked on this video had to hear 38 minutes of horseshit about Sebulba and <laughs> other nonsense. And I've been clickbaiting the hell out of them. To screw the yeah. dough pot, Slamo. And the um, <laughs> Cyberpunk 2077 is one of the biggest games this year. Well, we know it's coming out this fall. Uh, what we didn't know until this week was that it's also getting a exclusive controller on Xbox One X uh, or the Xbox One in general. Um, a new teaser appeared today on the official Xbox Twitter account with uh, sort of familiar cyberpunky glitch aesthetics, um, teasing something in a font akin to the stuff they're doing. Ooh, ooh, what could it be? Uh, well, don't worry, because Amazon Canada already snitched it the other day, and they showed us a picture of this controller. Uh, it's really cool. It's got this sort of split design to it. I really dig it. Um, this is uh, hypothetically going to launch alongside the game, we believe. Hopefully. Uh, we'll find out more very soon. But in the meantime, um, Dr. MG on IGN says, I can't tell if the controller is ugly or great. Have you all seen the controller, and what do you think? I think it looks awesome. I think it looks super cool. But I think it's one of the coolest controllers I've seen in a while. Damn. And I, I don't know. I, don't, I think it's I neat. Say, I don't think it's too gaudy. I just like the split pattern and then the, the red accents. I think it's neat. They're clearly going for that, that aesthetic that you see with the, the samurai gang, the sort of Johnny yeah. Silverhand, like, you know, flaming skull you see on the back of the main character's jacket. Uh, I don't think it's ugly enough. I think if you're going for like gaudy ass type, like this, this could very just e- easily be like, oh, it's the it's a God of War Xbox control. That doesn't make any sense. But it's like it's just sort of red and silver and black is like the so. Rise Son of Rome controller. Thank you. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Um, no, it's I, I don't know. It, it, also, I just want to point out and like CD Projekt Red, they love to they love to like do little winks and nods at their at their you know hardcore PC gamer crowd, the actual cyberpunks out there. But a mm-hmm. pre-made, uh, packaged uh, Xbox One controller is the least cyberpunk thing imaginable. <laughs> like kit bash your own nonsense. Well, Take that like adaptability kit and wire it into your in your cerebral cortex. But we're con- I bought a console to avoid all that, right? Yeah, but you want to get jacked in keyboard cowboy. 
I don't want to do. I, I'm tired. I don't want to get jacked in keyboard cowboy. I want to get the console. I want to get the controller in the this. mail and then strap in scrub. Then, We're going deep wanna, diving on the cybernet. I'm not going to do any of that. I just want to hold the controller and play the video game and go to bed early <laughs> at a reasonable hour. We're doing I'm some. Oh man, I'm tired. We're getting ice icebreaker DLC. We're going into the we're Ono Sendai oh, okay. oh, Cyberdyne right. system. <laughs> I think it looks cool. I do wonder. <laughs> I if, agree, John. <laughs> there we go. Um, I probably won't buy it because I keep to pretty basic controllers. Uh, mm-hmm. But I do wonder if it also <laughs> pretends them actually leading to a Xbox One themed console for Cyberpunk because even yeah. though. Xbox has not been winning in the sales generation or the sales this generation. What they have been doing a lot of, um, Sony has obviously done a lot of special edition PS4 games tied to like a Sony exclusives, but Xbox just puts out a ton of crazy random customized special edition Xbox ones. And so making one for one of the biggest games this year wouldn't be that big a shock. I mean, uh, last year, the year before, whenever that second Godzilla came out, they did Godzilla themed Xbox ones that had like Godzilla's back on it. Like they what? will go out. Yeah. They did like a trio of Godzilla themed Xbox one consoles. They will do crazy stuff. So an Xbox one themed cyberpunk 2077 edition seems totally within bounds. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually, uh, an interesting, uh, point because I that's actually sort of more cyberpunk than than the actual controller is because they actually constructed something around it. I was actually hoping this would be more uh, yellow and blue. I I really liked that that sort of like neon uh, hyper pastel uh, uh, you know uh, aggressively punk angle they were going with for for a while there. Yeah. Um, and it feels like they've tilted more into this stuff now. There are actually some some comments like Rosemary Media said, "Where's the fluorescent yellow controller? Give us what we mm-hmm. want." And I like to your point. I mean, it kind of matches the aesthetic more of what they've been going for before this. But I like the the more understated, like dark red, black and white. But no, maybe totally. I'm just boring. <laughs> you're you're wearing a floral print, and you have Pokemon behind. So I mean, I wouldn't call you that. There's, there's you know you have colors going. Um, I think that like. Uh, they they should sort of take away the uh, the kind of branding of, of of the yellow and blue that Fallout has kind of latched onto for so long now. Like, and I think when I see those colors now, I think of like Fallout seventy six, which is not necessarily what I should be thinking of. And so I'd rather I'd rather have a controller that's like bright yellow, and I can look down and see it, and just be like, "Ooh, Cyberpunk Xbox! I'm gonna pick it up." And play I think it. they could they could use some yellow and black in there. Yeah. Like that's a very like that sort of caution tape thing is very like that's very cyberpunk. Maybe they'll um, come out with a whole series, make everyone happy. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Or let you customize your own. Uh, in the meantime, we're all stuck inside, uh, and uh, many people are lonely, and they are figuring out solutions around that. Whether they are going uh, speed dating on Zoom or uh, jumping on Discord and meeting people for the first time. Uh, But some Tinder users are getting even more creative than that. Uh, Polygon had an amazing, heartwarming, and at times almost heartbreaking (laughs) story about how uh, Tinder users are using Animal Crossing, New Horizons specifically, to uh, interact with each other on first dates. Uh, I really, really like this story because... It opens up uh, a sort of a lot of conversation. One about the um, you know success of this game, and two the kind of adaptability of us as uh, humans uh, in these trying times. Did you guys all check out this story? I love this story, and I'm so excited to talk about it because it is just so silly and up my alley. <laughs> yeah, and so so they kicked off with this uh, sort of anecdote from this woman named Sam who went on a first date. Uh, she visited um, a nice man's island and uh, he took her on a tour around the island and um, she could tell he was a time traveler. <laughs> Which is the funniest, <laughs> the funniest thing to me. Uh, but she still stuck around. Um, and he dropped 63,000 bells at her feet and told her to pay off her debt. And uh, she said, thanks, but she's still going to ghost him. Yeah, she and- wow. said, totally ghosting him, though. Sorry, man. Guys, like, what the hell? It's never, <laughs> it's never okay to ghost people, especially when they pay off your debt for you. Like, what do you... What are you doing? No, ex- excuse nice. me. That is a, that is a really that is a that is a tacky move to be like, hey, I'm on a date with you. Here's money. Mm-hmm. 
Like that. I is- guess her. So Sam's original tweet was actually, um, "Where where is this kind of energy in real life? Go on a, a date with someone and they pay off your your loans for you." Right. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also saying this is someone who's been married for a little bit, but like, it, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to speak for like. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there. I'd be like, yeah, if someone paid for me, I'd be fine. Like, you nuke my dad, go for it. But I feel like that's yeah. that's that's less dating and that's more like kind of sugar daddy behavior. Well, there's there's websites for that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I haven't I haven't given people straight currency on a date before, but I have slayed a legiacris for someone on a first date, which was fun. It's what? a monster hunter monster. Th- it's a it's a monster hunter monster in, in Mon- monster hunter three ultimate on the three DS. Okay, you're, you're gonna have to walk us through this. But it's called I, a Leg- Legiacris. It's called the Legiacris. He he said so he the, was having a hard time which is beating French it. For and the, asked guy, if, the guy Chris. Like is it? <laughs> no, he was having a hard time beating this monster, and he asked if on our first date if I could bring my three DS and help him beat it, and I did. Oh, so you guys <laughs> both brought your 3DSs to like a... a we went to a bar. <laughs> you went to a bar and... <laughs> I mean, the a, guy was for him. Not a tavern or an inn? <laughs> no, a bar. <laughs> what, um... The, what, how did the rest of the date... Was he happy? Was he... Did, it, did you guys hit it off? Was, was there a second it ended day? up. It ended up not working out, but it was a nice time. There's that's, more that's to it, actually, but I don't know. <laughs> we, um, it was fun. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, you don't have to say any more than that. I'm not trying. Um, that is that is that is fascinating. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's just, uh, <laughs> You've left Ryan's speechless. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. No, you guys aren't like uh, like I, Max and Max and Jonathan. I do podcast beyond with you guys every week. I do NVC with Casey every week. It is a. It is a. It, wonderful experience because it is consistently uh there is a like a surprising uh sort of a, almost at, at times floridian anecdote that comes from her that i'm just like what that like she, that, she just told us a story yesterday about like a, a guy in college who deleted all her pokemon like no he, he stole my pokemon cartridges stole your po- yeah, stole oh, your pokemon. It, yeah casey look i've i've definitely associated <laughs> with far too many uh liars and psychopaths who, who just like sprinkle in just fancies and fantasies and nonsense every which way and like i don't think you do that i think you legitimately have some weird ass stories so it's it's pretty wonderful (laughs) they're Um, all true (laughs) it's true all of it uh so people uh to to pivot back to the story real quick which is totally on on the same page we're all talking about here um people are putting animal crossing info in their tinder bios uh and encouraging people to come visit their towns um which is interesting because it's sort of like giving I mean, it's more numbers than giving someone your number. It's it's like a nine-digit code and then a six-digit code. Um, but I wanted to talk about something that's sort of an interesting uh, thing that I've found with Animal Crossing is that I, I feel um, there's a kind of an intimacy to your island uh, in that you've put all this effort into it alone on a personal a personal level, and you've you built out your furniture and your house and stuff like that, and then having um, potential dates or total strangers show up uh sort of feels like this you definitely have to there's definitely like a internal conversation there um like i i i I tweeted a code at somebody the other day to like exchange items in the game and a bunch of people on twitter saw it and uh like eight eight or nine people kept coming to my town that i'd never seen before and it was like scary because you dox yourself dude that's that's yeah yeah i was like get out of my town like this this is my this is my quiet place. <laughs> but I guess it's this is safer than going to somebody's house, especially right now. I mean, you yeah. can just not give them best friend p- privileges and then they can't ruin it too bad. <laughs> no, they can like steal That's some true. fruit, but they can't dig your trees up or, mm-hmm. you know, smash your rocks. Would, would If you were just starting out in this game and... Um, you had a fruit and you met a total stranger on Tinder and they had a different fruit. Would you be worried that they were coming to your town to, to like take something from you and not necessarily because they were interested in you personally? Like, I would tell them they were after your money. They, they oh. might they might just be after your fruit. They might just be after exactly. your monster slaying abilities. You never really know these days with people. I mean, how, how, how much are turnips on your island is the question. Because I feel like... Yeah. I feel like no. you'd be like, oh yeah, I, like 
if you got turn tournaments for going for like you know six hundred bells, like you, that's I feel like that's that's up there with like nudes. <laughs> you, you, you know, put like that people, in your you put that in your Tinder bio. Yeah, people in this article are actually saying they were getting more conversation starters because they mentioned Animal Crossing in their um, bio, and some people specifically went out and bought Animal Crossing to go on dates for Tinder. <laughs> Okay. I actually, so, I went on a, I went on a date in Animal Crossing with my wife. Like it was very, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a hot, sexy date where we were it was like, hey, baby, here's sixty three thousand bells. You want to <laughs> shake my trees and get my peaches? You know, like we just went and she was, I was like, let's go to the aquarium together. And like I hadn't been to the aquarium yet, and so we like partnered up and we went to the aquarium and we walked around and it made me cry because we went to the Osaka aquarium on our honeymoon and it was like we we're just sitting on the couch next to each other, being like cute little versions of ourselves. It was like really endearing and lovely. And I don't know. It's, I don't know. Like what this game is. That yeah. game is wonderful. That game it's, is a wonderful it's, game. It's no, today's dating. It's no longer. What is it? It's no longer ASL. It's how much are your turnips going for? And what's your native fruit? <laughs> Those are the first two questions. What's your native fruit? Eggplant, baby. <laughs> oh no, Max. How dare you? <laughs> what happens when he has his first beer? Uh, I, I knew I knew like people back in the MySpace era that would basically they would see like a girl that they liked and go on their profile and then like write down all her favorite bands and stuff like that and then update their profile to be like I also like My Chemical Romance which I guess is the same thing as like buying Animal Crossing and putting it in your Tinder bio and being like I too am a huge hardcore Animal Crossing fan. Come get sure. those, them I mean, peaches. Who mm -hmm. who hasn't done that? Who hasn't lied about a thing they liked for someone they liked? Don't do that I'm, either. Me, You're just asking either. for trouble. You, you want people to like you well, for you. Uh, yes, what? but I mean, like, when I was a kid in fifth grade, I had a crush on a girl, and I heard her talking to another boy who I thought she had a crush on, and they were talking to friends, and I'd never watched friends before. Okay. So I decided, I went home and just, like, found whenever I looked in the TV guide and found all the times Friends was playing on, like, the WB and TBS and NBC and would just watch every episode I could so I could come back to school the next day and talk about Friends goofs. But you didn't lie about watching Friends. You actually I, went and did it. <laughs> no, but I said at first that I watched it. And okay. Then I, went, then I went and did the homework. That's really we cute. Had that, we had that email to, to Beyond talking about um, this guy who met a girl I had a crush on and she had like a Bloodborne tattoo and he's like I should, oh, yeah. I should go check out Bloodborne and he completely fell headfirst into Bloodborne and then went out went ahead and like platinum the game and then he saw the girl again he was like I, I platinum Bloodborne and she's like yeah that's an easy platinum <gasps> not true no. and that woman's name was Maria of the Astral Clock Tower <laughs> yeah <laughs> I um, haven't gotten to her yet she's, a, she's, a, she's actually okay she's fine <laughs> there was a in, when I was in 10th grade, I was very bad at school. No, I was good at school. I just didn't care. Was this um, like an exemption in like 10th grade specifically where you weren't good at school or was that just the entirety of school that you weren't good at it? It was most all, almost the whole, the whole part. Okay. The whole just to, just for yeah. context. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was, I was good at it. I just didn't try to be good at it, that, which is worse than being bad at it. Um, but anyway, there was this girl named Jenny and she was in my class and I think she liked me and uh, I was about to fail this class and I uh, flirted with her and then asked her if I could cheat on her test and she let me and I passed the test and then you ghosted I, her. I, then I ghosted her. <laughs> not great. I just feel like if we're all sharing stories, that's, I should put that one there, but that one had a, a different reaction than the other one. So now I'm not, this is not confession, it. Brian. This is a different, <laughs> and now my, my wife's walking out the door and not, <laughs> She's disappointed. The audience is mad. Really, it's just no winners here. I don't remember what test it was. I it mean, you you passed matter. the test. That's the, you won. You won. You won the game. If you hadn't it was, passed it that was test, you wouldn't have graduated college, and you wouldn't be here. Near. It was German class. I didn't even. I didn't even. I don't even know that language now. Four words, and I know most of that from going to games. Which I was going to segue into for our next story. Uh, <laughs> Gamescom has officially been canceled. It's going all digital. <laughs> Yeesh. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we knew this was going to happen. This is not surprising by any means whatsoever. Uh, but we only have a few minutes left in the show. I wanted to get into this one real quick. Um, I'm very happy that they are originally uh, saying that the show could happen and now just flat out saying it's not happening. As you all know, that is the largest video game convention on Earth. One of the biggest gatherings of human beings I think anyone will ever attend. Uh, Casey, you, did, you went to the show last year, right? I did. 
And Jonathan, it was have you ever insane. <laughs> I've, I've never been, no. Yeah. Casey, was that, was that your first, that was your first game? That was my first, too, right? first Gamescom. And it was incredible how massive it was and how crowded it was. And um, I think all of you warned me about how it would smell and you were not wrong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there's a, a palpable fun funk to it. It's like a pungent. There's just it stings when you when you smash thousands and thousands of people in a in a small room in the middle of summer. It's just not like it's unavoidable. <laughs> it's yeah, it's that, and I I feel like all of the food trucks there only make meat and uh like wet popcorn. <laughs> like that's the only thing that they cook, and so. Uh, like we we have a we have a, I have a photo of Destin Legary from IGN holding up. He has like these two swords that They're are just covered they in. Were, they were like, literally like kebabs. Meat swords. Yeah. yeah. Meat swords. <laughs> I think he. I think they like it was him and James Duggan. I think they were like we should buy these. They sound like items that we would we would want in the game. Yeah. Like let's get let's get the swords and they just kept getting them. Yep. Um, so you'll have to figure out how to do that at home. Uh, if you're watching along with Gamescom this year, that would actually be a really fun thing to do, Max. You and I should make a video about how to celebrate Gamescom at home. Honestly, um, like it, like going to Europe is like is bonkers on its own if you're an American. But like specifically yeah. how, like that is they they put us to shame. Like I, like I feel like as far as just like PAX is great, PAX Prime is is cool, uh, Comic Con is exciting, but I feel like Comic Con is like way too casual. It's like way too like kind of scatterbrained in terms of like what it's focusing on. Gamescom is like oh. Oh shit! This is this is like three hundred thousand gamers. Like this is like yeah, and every one like of them can run crisis. Yeah, that, that convention one. center can run crisis. Yeah, seriously. Um, so the the team at Gamescom is working full speed on uh, creating a digital version of the show, and uh, anyone who purchased tickets for the physical event will be refunded in the coming weeks, which is very cool and the opposite of what Ticketmaster is doing right now. So f you, Ticketmaster, because. <laughs> Max and I were going to go see Rage Against the Machine next month or this month. Was that like this week? April sixteenth yeah. is the date. Yeah, that was like in a week. Damn. Yeah, it. we were going to. Was it twenty sixth? Yeah, and they took three hundred bucks from me, and they're like, "You can't have that." Anymore. So, um, they're going to. That's great. Yeah, I think we should take um, the power back. That Ticketmaster is an evil empire. Yeah, f you. I won't do what they're, you tell me. They're making a killing <laughs> in the name of ticket prices. Bomb track. Anyway, that was the show this week. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, News, Games, and More is a show that airs every single day from 4 to 5. Uh, if you like what we did today, you'll love the splintered versions of the conversations we have every single week. Me and Max and Jonathan do Podcast Beyond. We put up a great episode just today. Uh, we talked all about PS5, PS4, and a lot of lies and rumors about stuff that didn't actually happen this week that we debunked because we're super sleuths and Encyclopedia Browns. <laughs> Additionally, Casey and I uh, do Nintendo voice chat if you want to hear us talk about Nintendo and the cool stuff they're doing over there and the Mario Legos and the theme parks and Crisis, Hardcore Gamers Unite. Uh, and afterwards, uh, we're doing the show tomorrow from 4 to 5, and right afterwards, Max and I will be doing Up at Noon. Uh, we've got a special guest, Todd McFarlane, legendary creator of Spawn, co-creator of Venom. So it's been a kick-ass week, and we're very excited. Thank you so much for listening and watching and hanging out with us today. Uh, and please share your awkward dating stories in the comments, and we'll read them at a later date on our own, sadly, while crying and drinking. See you soon.